Hey guys, Tyler here. In previous videos, I've asked you what alien species you want to see me cover on my channel. One of the most popular of these suggestions is the Ferengi from Star Trek. First introduced in The Next Generation and heavily featured in Deep Space Nine, the Ferengi are depicted as greedy hypercapitalists in contrast to the more socialistic Federation. One of my initial hesitations to covering them on this channel is that I wasn't really sure what I had to add to uh, the discourse about the species. They are in fact one of the most fleshed out species in Star Trek, uh, in some ways more so than the Vulcans or the Klingons. But I realized that is something I can actually use to my advantage, as it actually opens up opportunities for more discussion about this species, and in fact they do possess a lot of unique traits. In this video I'll discuss various aspects of their biology as well as their history and culture, and also examine the history of their depictions throughout various episodes of Star Trek, going from a rather comical adversary in early episodes of The Next Generation to a species with a more complex cultural background. So without further ado, let's jump right in. As far as their appearance, the Ferengi uh, are shorter than humans on average. Externally, they possess orange-brown skin, blue fingernails and toenails, large heads, wrinkled noses, sharp teeth, and large ears, uh, referred to as lobes. These lobes give them rather acute hearing, and they are able to discern a person's gender and species, even through electronic interference and atmospheric distortion, and they can even tell the decibel level of a sound. Such acute hearing would have given them a distinct advantage in their early evolutionary history as they would be uh, better able to overcome predators and catch prey themselves. Their internal anatomy also includes upper and lower lungs as well as a four-lobed brain that is difficult if not impossible to read by telepaths and empaths. Notably the human brain is categorized often into six lobes uh, depending on the definition. So the four-lobed anatomy of the Ferengi brain, which various production sources have also said applies to the Breen and the Dopterians, can be interpreted to mean that various functions are grouped together in a way that is truly alien compared to most Earth mammals. As far as their diet, the Ferengi are primarily insectivores. They eat bugs, although they also eat other invertebrates like crabs or slugs. Ferengi are notably picky about uh, what kind of bugs they eat. They only like Ferengi bugs and do not eat bugs, usually from other planets. In Earth taxonomy, insectivores actually used to comprise uh, an entire order of animals, but were later reclassified as not all insectivores are closely related. In addition to some other insects, uh, examples of insectivores include various species of birds, frogs, lizards, spiders, and mammals such as anteaters, aardvarks, opossums, and bats. Indeed, early designs for the Ferengi actually uh, depicted them with more bat-like ears. Between these traits, as well as their inclination to hiss when threatened, the Ferengi evolutionary lineage may include analogs to various carnivorous mammals such as cats or uh, even small primates like the lemur or pygmy marmoset. In fact, some research even suggests that the earliest primates were in fact uh, nocturnal arboreal insectivores. Given the swampy conditions of the Ferengi homeworld, it's not hard to imagine uh, that their ancestors would have made the evolutionary leap from the trees to the ground as they evolved into predators with more complex brains. The teeth of insectivores, even the mammals, also varies quite a bit from species to species. Some have more pronounced canines, while others actually have reduced canines, indicating that the teeth of individual species would have evolved for other purposes besides uh, crunching down on some grubs. Tastes like chicken. It's also possible that the Ferengi may have been eating insects for a relatively brief time in their history, having shifted away from a more diverse diet, possibly as a response to overpopulation and or changing climactic conditions on their homeworld, although this is entirely speculative. Speaking of the Ferengi homeworld, it, uh, along with their capital city, are named Ferenginar. Like the other homeworlds of various humanoid Star Trek aliens, Ferenginar is a Class M planet with 
Earth-like conditions. As a matter of fact, the writers made a conscious decision to give Ferenginar a more moist, swampy climate as opposed to most other Star Trek environments, which are hot and dry. Ferenginar has uh, nearly constant planet-wide torrential rains, rotting vegetation, and rivers of muck. It's unclear whether these climactic conditions have existed for eons on the planet or, again, whether they are uh, the result of anthropogenic climate change. What is clear, though, is that these conditions have been around for long enough to have a significant impact on Ferengi culture, as they have 178 words for rain in its various forms, and their architecture incorporates domes and uh, other sloped surfaces to provide for water runoff. We haven't seen the star that Ferenginar orbits on screen, but uh, non-canon reference materials do state that it's either an M-type red dwarf star or a K-type orange star. According to real-life science, most planets orbiting red dwarf stars would be tidally locked, meaning that one side of the planet always faces the star and is in perpetual daylight, while the other side faces away from the star and is in perpetual night. Alien species evolving on such a world would probably look and behave much differently from what we're familiar with due to the planet's uh, weird ecosystems. Though there are some M-class planets with humanoid civilizations in Star Trek that orbit red dwarfs, more are actually shown orbiting red giants but Star Trek star charts and stellar cartography do not depict the Ferengi star as being particularly large, so I'm more inclined to believe that Ferenginar orbits a K-type orange star, not unlike the Vulcan sun. These types of stars are actually among the most stable in the universe and the second longest lived, creating a relatively calm stellar radiation environment for life to evolve on planets with strong magnetic fields. The Ferengi language is particularly interesting from a human perspective. Uh, their main alphabet consists of over 60 phonetic symbols, almost as long as the Khmer alphabet used in Cambodia, which has 74 letters. The Ferengi language is written like a flowchart, with text radiating out at 60 degree angles from a central hexagon uh, that denotes subject or tense. We also see Ferengi text written from left to right as well, so between this and the different sounding spoken languages and various appearances. Gucci die, crush on boy. You're not. No, I'm Citron. It's clear that uh, there are multiple Ferengi dialects and that speakers of these different dialects all do business throughout the galaxy. Recorded Ferengi history, as far as we're aware, uh, dates back at least 10,000 years. Around this time, the concepts of currency and profit were first invented in Ferengi culture. Fundamental precepts of Ferengi society, such as greed and materialism, were enshrined in the rules of acquisition written by the first Grand Nagus, Ghent. The Ferengi developed many aspects of a modern economy long before humans did, such as banking and speculative investments and even a unified global economy by 2700 BC. Early Ferengi were apparently less greedy than their modern descendants, indicating a slow but steady acceptance of the rules of acquisition into virtually every facet of Ferengi life. Despite their long-time practice of capitalism, the Ferengi notably avoided atrocities like slavery and genocide and concentration camps and nuclear or interstellar wars. This less violent approach to building their civilization may be one reason that they took 5,000 years to go from globalization to acquiring warp drive, owing to a slower rate of industrialization. In any case though, their definition of slavery did not extend to their treatment of women, and the Ferengi have been shown uh, being perfectly willing to engage in the trading of alien slaves, if profitable. Violence is also not completely absent from Ferengi society as they still practice capital punishment, but for the most part, as Quark and others would proudly boast, day-to-day -day life on Ferenginar is relatively peaceful, although as we see, this is not a positive peace, but a negative peace. Overall, Ferengi society as depicted in the 24th century is still 
quite far from being liberal, as they are extremely patriarchal and misogynistic. Before progressive reforms under Grand Nagus's Zek and Rom, women were barred legally from earning profit, being able to travel, wearing clothes, expressing opinions or political views, or inheriting property. Marriages were business contracts between the groom and the father of the bride, with the bride being treated as property that was being leased from one family to another. It is only in the third quarter of the 24th century that some semblance of gender equality under the law is embraced as the Ferengi come to realize that enfranchising half their population would actually be good for business. In this way, initial reforms under Zek and Rom, including taxes to fund social programs like welfare and retirement benefits and health care, are uh, intended to preserve Ferengi capitalism, but further influence from the moneyless federation does put the Ferengi on track to become a more equitable society. Other developments in this vein include shifting beliefs among observers of the Ferengi religion, traditionally centered on earning material wealth to be rewarded in the afterlife. After the Dominion War, 40% of Ferengi no longer believed that uh, they needed to buy their way into the so-called divine treasury. The Ferengi Alliance, the formal name of the Ferengi government, is located in the Alpha Quadrant with its seat of power on Ferenginar located about 60 light years from Bajor. The alliance is dedicated to promoting Ferengi profit and commerce. As businessmen have served as pillars of Ferengi society for millennia, this has led to a slow merging of the business and political fields with the Ferengi Commerce Authority enforcing trade bylaws on behalf of the Alliance. Ferengi territory covers a relatively small region of space with just shy of a dozen systems located close to their homeworld. But as we see, Ferengi trade and business ventures mean that they are quite ubiquitous throughout local space. In fact, this could be why they have such a low Borg species designation number. 180. Perhaps members of the species visited the Delta Quadrant by accident through a wormhole or the mycelial network. The mycelial network is like mycelial network. Or the Borg encountered them in the Alpha Quadrant through a transwarp hub. Speaking of warp, it's uh, stated in various background sources that the Ferengi actually purchased warp drive from the Breen and that this transaction occurred sometime between the mid-20th and mid-22nd centuries. Indeed, in the episode Little Green Men, Cork indicates that the Ferengi lacked warp drive as late as 1947. Apparently, unlike Zephram Cochran, uh, the Ferengi did not view it as profitable to develop it on their own. The Ferengi are also said to be related to the Dopterians, who themselves have a close resemblance to the Cardassian-aligned Cabherians. This could indicate some speciation of Ferengi space travelers after the acquisition of warp drive, although just as with many other examples of evolution in Star Trek, the time frame of Ferengi uh, exploration is not long enough for such radical changes to occur naturally. So the Adopterians might be genetically engineered, or they could have been a, uh, another humanoid race on Ferenginar who was forced off-world, although I don't think that that's likely. Ultimately, I think that the most reasonable explanation uh, is that the Adopterians, being referred to as distant relatives of the Ferengi, means that they simply share aspects of their anatomy and happen to have evolved in the same region of space. The Ferengi are generally neutral in interstellar affairs, even lacking a standing military, but early on the Ferengi were intended to be a recurring antagonist on the next generation, just as the Klingons had been uh, on the original series. However, this did not go over very well. Their first appearance in the season one episode, The Last Outpost, has been widely regarded as a disaster, with the Ferengi coming across not as menacing as Gene Ronberry had initially conceived. Ronberry created the Ferengi as an analog to the greedy Wall Street financiers of the 1980s. The name Ferengi is derived from the Arabic and Persian word Ferengi, meaning Frank, as in the Frankish or European traders who made contact with the Arab world. Ferengi later came to mean foreigner, and in modern Arabic, still means European. Ronberry was very explicit about various aspects of Ferengi culture, describing uh, for example, their various sex positions in excruciating detail to TNG writer Herb Wright. Yes, this happened. 
As you can imagine, these kinds of details did not make it into the final draft of The Last Outpost, or for that matter, any draft. It was really Ron Berry just rambling on about Ferengi sex positions. After the failure of their initial appearance, the Ferengi are no longer planned as recurring antagonists for the Enterprise D, uh, although they were featured in more episodes of TNG. By the time Deep Space Nine was being developed, they were actually in a position to be taken more seriously as a species with a more complex culture. They effectively emerged as more likable analogs to 20th century humans, possessing many of the same inclinations, such as greed and materialism, that we honestly still exhibit today, as opposed to the future humans of the Star Trek universe who have moved beyond uh, greed and materialism. While Ferengi-centric episodes of DS9 still received a rather mixed reception from fans, many of the writers have stated how proud they are of how the species turned out, uh, coming a long way from their one-dimensional debut. There's so much more to Ferengi culture than can fit in a video like this, with over 90 appearances across the various series, in addition to Quark's regular appearance on DS9. It's no wonder that they are one of the most fleshed out species in Star Trek. Their alliance's ubiquity throughout local space will presumably only continue to grow uh, in the coming centuries of Star Trek lore, and as we see in Discovery Season 3, they're still pretty active in the 32nd century. It will be interesting to see how their civilization evolves as they uh, continue to tackle various social ills on their home world and respond to outside pressures throughout the galaxy. As many have noted, it probably will take generations for Ferengi women to fully integrate into the workforce as they have to unlearn various social expectations associated with their second-class citizenship. And it could take just as long for the Ferengi to uh, come up with long-term solutions for things like poverty and corruption. But I do think, ultimately, that uh, featuring them in future installments of Star Trek will provide further storytelling opportunities uh, that will help us reflect on other aspects of their culture and how those relate to, well, us today. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and comment and don't forget to share it. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. If you haven't subscribed already, be sure to do that as well uh, so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support the channel even further, then becoming a member or a patron is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and my merch store are in the description below. Speaking of the merch store, you can get a shirt just like this at teespring.com slash stores slash Orange River Productions. That's about all I have for this week. Live long and prosper.